Hi and welcome. I'm Andy Cates and we're here at the wrap-up of CROI 2018 and I'm here with Dr. Monica Gandhi. Uh, she is uh, the director of Ward 86, which is uh, San Francisco's big HIV clinic. She's from the University of California, San Francisco, and joined the family business along with her brother. You guys should look that up. <laughs> anyway, we're here to talk about hair and obviously I'm the perfect person to do this. Um, <laughs> But you've been doing hair analysis. Yes. So for 15 years, actually, we've been doing uh, hair analysis where we look at HIV drugs in hair samples in both um, HIV prevention, mostly PrEP, okay. with tenofovir FTC, and with treatment. And, um, and now we've done it in, a, in the biggest treatment trial we've ever looked at. But we had been doing hair even before this as a metric of adherence. Interesting. So. You say 15 years, I mean, we're kind of just now hearing about yes. this, and so many of us thought it was a new thing. Yes. But uh, has it just taken that long to, to develop the assays or to get acceptance or both? I think it's both. It takes a long time to develop the assays. We have a very highly specialized lab, mm -hmm. so I wouldn't try it at home necessarily. Like, it took us a long time to get it right. We have really high quality assays. We actually go through an NIH lab, the CPQA program, to get everything um, approved before we ever do any work in the networks. And so it took us a while to develop the assays. And then I think that we needed to get hair into a big treatment trial for to get attention. And that's where we luckily were able to work with the ACTG on this analysis to get into a big treatment trial. So we were very excited. Interesting. So there's so there's several different ways of getting information bio, biologically. You know, there's the blood draw. Yes. There's urine. There's cerebrospinal fluid. Yes. I guess saliva for certain things. Yes. Dried blood spots. Yes. And now hair. Yes. So the idea is that to truly assess adherence or exposure, um, a really good way to do that is to measure a drug level in something that you can get out of the human body, um, because drug you're ingested and then it gets, it distributes all over the body and you can get it. And there are advantages to each of those matrices mm -hmm. that you mentioned. Plasma's easy because we're always drawing blood. Urine's easy because it's easy to get urine. Um, dried blood spots um, also are easy, but hair has some advantages over those other measures. And one is that it takes a while for drug to get into the hair over time, so it really measures a long-term measure of adherence. So you mm -hmm. can't just take the drug the day before and get in the hair, it really has to measure long-term adherence. That long-term aspect is helpful. Hair is also easy to collect, it mm -hmm. doesn't hurt. You don't have to stick someone. It's good for children. Wait, wait, wait. It doesn't hurt. <laughs> it doesn't okay. hurt except for maybe if you pull if you have, someone's no, hair. Well, but we don't. Oh. oh no, we don't pull hair. No. So pulling hair, I think, would really reduce the acceptability. Yeah. Never pull hair ever. Cut. So we cut it right at the scalp. Oh, okay. So um, we don't actually need anything from the follicle or the roots. We just need hair as it comes out of the scalp. So we cut it right at the scalp. Doesn't hurt. Put it in an envelope. Put a piece of tin foil on it doesn't need biohazardous, you can you know, touch it um, with your bare hands, you don't need gloves, and you can ship it at regular mail with a letter that says it's not biohazardous. And no refrigeration. So no refrigeration, yeah, that's an advantage. But you have to have specialized people to do it or yes, not? Yes, yes, I think that that is right, that at this moment, where we are now in this, we need a special lab and we need special equipment. And our lab's been doing this for a long time, I would definitely recommend a lab that's been doing it for a while, because it does take very high quality to do it, but the aim would be to get it more bedside or to get it less specialized with maybe a different type of system. We're working on that. I'm not sure we'll get there. We have another test um, mm -hmm. to look at uh, drug levels in urine that really is bedside. That we've been working on for 10 years. I think we finally got it and now we're going to test it. And that would be like a dipstick. And that will be a lot easier oh, wow. and won't require specialized laboratories. But hair right now does. And the urine would only show you what's happening right now. That's right. It's a snapshot. Urine and plasma are both always going to be snapshot. You could take your med the day before and look great. Okay. So you're, are you leaving people with bald spots? No, because we did not touch your head. Please tell them that we did not touch your head. I didn't touch your head. This is not me because, because um, it, it's 50 strands of hair So uh, at the most. So I think it's very little hair. Uh -huh. We lose about 100 strands of hair from our head just in the course of a day. And it's not very much hair. We don't disrupt hairstyles. We don't hurt anyone. And I think it's pretty easy. But... 
we have to get the people to agree, not necessarily in the study, but the people who are usually doing the study, they have to kind of buy onto it, the field staff and the okay. investigators. And that's been sometimes a barrier. They have to be into it and not say, oh, this is some weird thing you're doing. So that will get acceptance over time. It's taken a while. Okay. So hair grows incrementally, what, about a centimeter a month? Exactly. Something like that? Exactly. So, um, just you as an example, how how much time does that represent on like one yes, year? Yes, I I could probably we could look at my adherence, which I'm not very adherent um, to my calcium, for example. But we could look at my adherence over say 20 months because I have wow. about 20 centimeters of hair. Wow! And the good thing is that what you just mentioned, that idea that you can take a strand of hair and know that it serves as a marker of time, so that if you take a centimeter of it, you've marked it, you take a centimeter and you look at the exposure in that centimeter, then down one centimeter and down one centimeter. You can actually look at exposure and adherence over time. Wow. And that is okay in treatment. It can be helpful at times. We think that in prep that could be more helpful. If someone is on prep, they unfortunately, they seroconvert to HIV. If we can take that segmental analysis, was it here where they weren't as adherent? You know, that oh. may be helpful in the case of seroconversion. It's like having a time machine. Yes, it is a marker of time. Wow. Only on the scalp. Okay. Because the this... pubic hair, the armpit hair, I feel that God loves us. <laughs> um, it does not grow indefinitely. That's a wonderful thing. Okay, so it's since, good. since it stays a certain length, you wouldn't be able to get It's not a marker time. of time, exactly. Uh, it's really the scalp hair. Okay. And then, yes, there are people who don't have hair in their heads. I've heard, I've heard of this. But, but, they, but people who have male pattern baldness, we can certainly get the fringe. Uh -huh. And then if someone shaves their head, we would say, okay, please, could you wait like a week or two? And we, even yeah. a little bit of hair, because we have the sensitive machine, we can do the analysis. Okay, yeah. Well, that's that's kind of interesting. Um, so you, you say that you've had luck with acceptability, but I'm having it a hard time understanding how certain groups would would be willing to do this. Yeah. And and you're a woman and I'm not calling you vain, yes. but you know, women typically are concerned about their looks and their But it's women, it's highly acceptable. It's MSM uh, who are giving us a little more trouble. Really? So, so do I need women, to talk to these guys? Yes, so women have had very little problems giving hair, we've had great acceptability. The Weiss cohort actually has been doing this for years, the women's study. Um, the, uh, lots of women in Asian Africa have no problems. MSM, we've had a little harder time, and the two reasons they cite is baldness, which you can't argue with. If someone's really bald, you can't do it. Right. And, um, and hairstyle disruption. But then we try to tell them we really won't disrupt your hairstyle. So women, women in this case, are very easy going. Okay, so <laughs> um, that's nice to know. Uh, with uh, with hairstyles, I mean, for men nowadays, uh, I'm not a great example of it, but there's a lot of styles that have a lot of product in yeah. the hair, um, and and for women as well. Yeah. Uh, what does that do to hamper your results? None of the products, perming, straightening, um, coloring, seem to matter. So we've done those experiments in the laboratory where we've taken lots of hair and done all sorts of things to it that you can imagine, processing products, and, and that doesn't interfere with our results at all. Bleaching does, though. So if we see like someone's hair and it's clearly completely bleached, we'll write a little warning in our results or we won't do it all, saying this is probably not reliable. So, so Guy, just pure Guy Fieri is not a candidate? No, no. Okay. He, I don't know what he's doing with his meds, but we can't tell. <laughs> okay. So that's, that's interesting. So, wow. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of, of a downside. I mean, there's a lot of people that are fearful of needles, yeah. uh, and it does take expertise to, to use a needle if yes. you know, for a provider, yes. um, and you know, things can get messy, things can ha you can have accidents, Yes, uh, it's a little risky at times, and certainly with the hair, you're still going to have to get blood for certain things, yes. you know, you need yes. plasma for viral loads and, and right. stuff, but, uh, um, but the hair could answer quite a bit. It has those advantages. Easy to collect, store at room temperature, ship at room temperature, bio, no biohazard. Those are all advantages. And you mentioned urine as far as uh, something that you can get quickly as a point of care yes. test. Uh, yes. What are you doing with that? That would be a yes-no test if you have tenofovir in your urine. Okay. And we think we're going to get quantitative results too, but you still can just take it the day before and still looks 
good. So that mm -hmm. white coat adherence we're not going to get away from on the Tenofovir, but it's eventually going to be a dip test. We are putting in a grant right now and hope to have this completely done in a year, mm -hmm. and then we'll try to get it out there. And I think it could be good for prevention and treatment. I think you still have to back it up with a longer test yeah. if you want to get longer term patterns, but it'll be good for point of care. Sometimes people have said in prep trials, if you told me I didn't have drug results in my body, I would have been, um, I would have had my self-report a little more accurate. You know, if they knew that this was being monitored and so they weren't saying that in a that's bad what way. Yeah. So that, white coat yeah, right. Yes. Is. Like Voice really showed this. They went back in time and they said to these women who weren't taking the meds, they, they had done plasma levels and they said, look, uh, we did plasma levels, you weren't taking the meds. And first, and this is a very interesting qualitative study uh, by Ariane van der Straten, but first they said, no, no, I was taking it. And there was a moment they said, okay, yeah, it wasn't. And let me tell you why. And there were good reasons why. And then they said, boy, if I'd known you were doing that, I would have probably told you what I was doing. Yeah. So I hope that drug level feedback and monitoring, we still have to test it, could be in real time, could be beneficial for adherence. So if you were doing a study, for example, let's look backward at history, uh, like FemPrep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So there were significant adherence issues yes. there. Lots of white coat adherence, yes. apparently. Yes, yes. Um, but there were, there were definitely, it, it, there were definitely people that were inadherent to their medication and yes. there were zero conversions because of it. Yes. Uh, if you could go back in time and, and insert yourself in this hair assay into that trial, would you be able to you know, monitor the hair you know, monthly or, or, or quarterly to where it might have made a difference? Yes, I mean, that actually is what they're doing with the depivirine ring in a way. They are in real life looking at the ring and then giving feedback, not to participants, not to individual investigators, but kind of in a very general broad way to sites. Hey, we're not seeing great adherence. And it's increasing, you know, that idea that you should monitor in real time and give feedback is, is really emerged out of fem prep and voice mm -hmm. because if we'd been able to do that in more real time, it wouldn't have ended probably in no efficacy. And so that is, I think, the result of those trials completely revamped the question of objective adherence monitoring and how to insert yourself into the study. It's really interesting, and I think we will more. Yeah. Well, it sounds it sounds to me like if that actually became part of the metric for for measuring adherence, uh, and it became utilized very widely, then people would know ahead of time that they're going to be doing hair sampling, yeah. and they would probably be more adherent. Yes. It, you know? It's by definition, if you know you're being monitored, at least in every study, they, they will be more adherent. Yeah. And in fact, that has been shown in diabetes. Like, if you know that um, hemoglobin A1C is going to be tested, like, at a point of care, and you get feedback, people are more, more they're better with their oral hypo... It's just human nature. Yeah. And a hemoglobin A1C, that's not, like... Uh, not like your glucose yeah. level, that's a longer it's a long term. term. That's, we always call hair levels like the hemoglobin A1Cs of Monterey. Okay. Longer Good. term. Good. I want to get back to the, to the depivirine ring. So you can measure in hair what a ring is doing inside yes. the vaginal tissue. This is Does experimental. It? We have a grant on this, but we are going to be doing the hair levels in, in the HOPE trial uh -huh. in, in the depivirine vaginal ring. So right now their measure of adherence is taking out the ring and looking at residual drug levels in the ring. Like if you've kept it in longer, you'd have lower levels because it leaches out. That is pretty time consuming and hard and you have to do it in a ring. And so we're hoping hair levels could be a maybe easier to get measure, but we don't know. We've collected hair on everyone. We have them in our lab. We're gonna be analyzing them. And when the results of the trial come out, we will have the hair results too. Yes, we can even from a ring, even that little bit of absorption into the bloodstream, we have such sensitive machines, we can see it in the hair. We're already seeing it. Wow. That's impressive. Yeah. I mean, it's impressive because I, I would have thought that, you know, the, the vaginal tissue is rather protective anyway. No. And like contraceptives, there's just enough that gets in the blood. And if wow. you have a high enough sensitivity machine, you can see it. Okay. That's, uh, that's really neat. So I'm trying to think of uh, any other any One other more application, points. I'll say. Okay. Um, and I like to use the words application because it's like a hair funny thing. Uh -huh. Okay, but one more thing which is long acting. Are you just teasing me right now? No, well, because, okay, Gee, that's a good one. See what I, I did? I'm not really trying to tangle with you. Ah. Um, so long acting medications, there's this true concern, right, like of the pharmacokinetic tail, right? Like that you will have a long acting, someone won't come in for their every four week or every eight week treatment and then there'll be this longer tail of the medication. So I think we're going to end up incorporating pharmacologic measures 
not of adherence, because we know when we give the injectable, right. but of exposure uh -huh. in the context of long-acting treatment and prevention. And I think hair will have a role, plasma will have a role, urine will have a role. So I think the long-acting is in another place where we're going to be interested in objective metrics of exposure. It seems to me like that would that would be uh, pretty useful in, in determining therapeutic levels. Yes. Because the tail is going to have you know, activity, therapeutic activity yes, for, for a while. while. And then it'll get and to And then a it'll drop down. Yeah. Um, wow. And you don't want it to get that close. And so you may be monitoring someone and someone maybe metabolizes it faster. Maybe he, that person gets four weeks every mm -hmm. four weeks and this person gets every eight weeks. I think we're, pharmacology and, it, and exposure is going to be have a big role in long acting. Got it. So how is this being received amongst your peers and uh, investigators around the world? I think it's being received as well. I have been doing, we, our group has been doing hair for a while. So they, everyone was always um, knows that we're enthusiastic about hair, but we're very, we were excited to partner with ACTG. Yeah. And I think that did definitely uh, got it a little more attention and we're just thrilled that ACTG allowed this to happen. And um, so yeah, we've been getting good response. That's good, that's good. And I hope the response even gets better. It's hair raising up. really. It's, it, the it is hair raising. We've been getting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I mean, if you comb through the data, <laughs> I'm sure you'll find that uh, that it's going to be more and it's more. It's not always smooth, though, to, to develop uh, these. You know, sometimes yeah. it gets a little gnarly, but it's we, we get there. Yeah, and like yeah. you know, it's flat or a body. Of... <laughs> we just sometimes okay. We can actually do this for the next half an hour, so we maybe could, we'll just we? stop. But <laughs> <laughs> anything else on your mind that, uh, that have no, you seen? No, thank you for letting me talk about it. Thank no, you. thank you. I think it's really exciting. Um, it's you. it's nice to be able to think of of having some way of measuring things that has no pain to it. Yes. Um, yes. And certainly, you know, if we look at, at some of the, uh, the issues that we have to overcome in, in developing countries, you know, refrigeration is a big deal. Yes, yes. Um, certainly. Shipping, expense, all exactly, that is obvious. Exactly. And children, and, and children do not like needles, so hopefully we'd have a role there too. One last thought. When you store samples, for example, in, in plasma, you have a, a very expensive manner of storing them. It's yeah. 80 degrees below zero yes. in, a, in a freezer unit yes. that is, has to be completely monitored, checked. They go down, you have to fix them. Yes. Are you able to store samples of hair and, and still get information in a long period of time? Oh, yeah. I mean, forensics is where hair really got its day. I mean, you know, when you think about who does hair analyses in the world, it's like the FBI. Mm -hmm. And they dig up bodies, and those bodies have been there for a long time. The, the drugs, compounds are very, very stable in hair. So um, I get hair samples at Croy. People hand them to me, and I carry them home in my suitcase. We have an IRB for that. We have um, we have a letter that people carry that say this is not biohazardous. This is what the CDC says about hair. So it's all very safe, and they're flat, so they don't take much room, and they can be stored indefinitely. That's great. So. Another, now I'm thinking of more and more things. What about fingernails? If someone's not into doing their hair, we have not looked at fingernails. There's certainly substance use testing in fingernails. We people have asked us to do that. Um, fingernails don't grow indefinitely either, and we like things okay. that grow as a marker of time. Okay, that makes sense. So that's sense. why that makes sense. We think of fingernails like pubic hair, and then for some reason, like the lab thinks fingernails are gross, and I don't know why they think that's gross and hair is not. Only They're toenails like, I'm not are doing gross. it. Yeah, I think only toenails are gross. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, awesome. I really appreciate you Thank speaking you. with us. It's good seeing you. Thank you. We'll it's keep good to see you. Uh, we'll keep an eye on what's going on with the hair. Yes, exactly. And, uh, and good luck with it all. Okay. Enjoy thank you. Don't keep it under your hat. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>